In this episode, I chat with Rachel Podnos O'Leary and Clay Stackhouse about personal finance and credit unions. We discuss a variety of topics, such as the key financial differences between millennials and baby boomers, as well as service members from non-service members, the difference between wealth and income, simple steps to follow in order to achieve financial independence, the benefits of shared branching and credit unions over banks, and a bunch more. Rachel Podnos O'Leary is a certified financial planner and a licensed attorney. Clay Stackhouse is a regional outreach manager at Navy Federal Credit Union. I am a big fan of and an advocate for credit unions myself. I think in general, they're great institutions that are often overlooked by most people. So I'm looking forward to bringing you guys these two conversations all about personal finance and credit unions. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Rachel Podnos O'Leary. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Uh, So I'm a financial planner uh, by trade. I live in D.C., I work in a family financial planning firm uh, with my father and my siblings, and they are based in Florida and Texas. Uh, So yeah, we've been doing the remote thing for a long time, uh, way before COVID. And we work with clients all over the country um, and have a lot of virtual or remote client relationships. and, and I love working with people that way. I love not being limited uh, to working with people in just the geographic area where I'm located. Um, I'm a new mom. I have a five-month-old daughter. So that's kind of been a big adven- adventure for me uh, this year. Uh, yeah, I, I got into financial planning kind of accidentally. I majored in political science in college and I had no idea what to do with that. So I went to law school like many other political science majors. Um, and then law school just never really clicked with me. Uh, I didn't enjoy it. I, I never found any particular uh, area of the law that was that interesting to me. So after I passed the bar, I moved up to DC from Florida, uh, which is where, where I was at the school. And I was just hoping to get into something more kind of non-traditional. Uh, there's a lot of that up here. And I ended up at an investment management firm. And I was very green. I didn't know anything about investing um, at all. But I, I, really, I really enjoyed it and found it interesting. So I uh, became a certified financial planner. And I, I've been working in, in finance ever since then. Um, I, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's so rewarding interesting. Every day is different. Um, And earlier this year, I published a book called 21st Century Wealth. And that's kind of my take on just a high level uh, roadmap for millennials who want to achieve financial independence. Well, first off, congratulations on the baby. I have a two and a half, I guess almost three-year-old. He'll be three next month. So (laughs) <laughs> um, I've been down that path. I know I know what five months is like, and I know what that first, I mean, really six months to a year is like. So I know know what you're going through, but congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, it's been it's been quite uh, the journey so far. I, I look I look forward to all the fun ahead. So <laughs> it became really fun for me at about a year and a half. That's when they became a lot of fun for me. You make I the keep point. Hearing that. <laughs> yeah, that's when they start to be able to interact and actually, you know, talk and walk and. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. But you mentioned that you wrote a book and you make a point in your book that millennials face a very different financial landscape than older generations, especially baby boomers. What are some of the key differences between millennials and their parents? Why are those differences important? Yeah, I do. I talk about that in the book. And, you know, it's broadly discussed today. It's such a hot topic, um, you know, amongst baby boomers and millennials, us and our parents. Um, But but there are some some big differences. So baby boomers generally kind of became adults in the 70s and 80s. Um, 
And when they were entering adulthood, the cost of living uh, in general was much lower than it is today, uh, especially when it comes to housing and education, which, as we all know, have been two of the major kind of pain points for, for millennials. Um, and, you know, the stereotypical baby boomer backstory is um, go to college, get a four year degree, whatever that is, get a stable, you know, decent paying job, immediately buy a home and start a family. And, and then you enjoy, you know, um, one of the periods of greatest economic growth in U.S. history and two decades of um, high GDP and wage growth and good stock market returns, um, low unemployment. That's kind of the typical baby boomer um, coming into adulthood and on experience. And we can contrast that with the experience of, of most millennials, which is a little different. You know, we kind of most of us came of age in and around the Great Recession. Um, and there was a lot of economic uncertainty, obviously, um, during that time and, and following it for a long time after. And we faced some really tough economic trends as we were entering adulthood, you know, high unemployment, uh, tuition inflation, and a, a growing reliance on student loans uh, that went hand in hand with that. Uh, changes in the need for skilled workers and, and stagnant wages, um, increases in the cost of health care, increases in the cost of housing, just, just kind of a, the perfect storm of, of things that, that we kind of came up against. And I do think it's important to acknowledge those differences because um, that experience really has in some ways shaped the millennial generation, it's shaped the way we see ourselves and it's shaped our worldview. Um, you know, there's this idea of the American dream that each generation builds a better life for their children than they had uh, themselves. And I think, I think millennials, this may be changing actually, but I think uh, historically millennials have been a little cynical um, when it comes to that idea. And, um, they, they feel that maybe that's not a possibility for them. I, I actually disagree. I do think it's a possibility. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the message in my book. Uh, but, but I do think that the, the coming of age in, into a period of economic uncertainty, I, I do think that that really had a profound effect on, on the millennial worldview. I recently saw a picture. I think it might've been on Twitter, but it was a comparison of a single family house. It was nothing super fancy. It was a starter house. It didn't have the location or anything, but it said it was roughly $135,000 in the 90s. And then it said today it's worth about $490,000. And then below it, it had the average starting salary for a teacher in the area back in the same time period of when the house was originally priced at $135,000. And they said that the salary was about $60,000. And then they said, fast forward to today, the average salary for a teacher in that same area is only 64,000. So you could see that the wages only went up from 60 to 64, but the house went from 135 to 490. So clearly there's a big disconnect between the cost of houses and wages increasing. And I think this can be, it's not just the cost of houses. I think the cost of a lot of different goods and services, as well as assets have been significantly outpacing the increase in wages. And I think that's the best way to just summarize everything that you just mentioned. And it's mm -hmm. tough to, to tough to come into for millennials. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great example. And, you know, now we're, we're seeing even more. It's in the news every day. Um, housing prices are just, they're absolutely insane right now. So rather than focusing on how millennials maybe were dealt a bad hand, what can we do as millennials to overcome this and achieve financial independence anyway? Yeah, so I, I agree that, you know, I, I do think millennials were kind of dealt a bad hand, um, but I don't think that means that we're doomed um, because uh, we're very young and time is on our side and time is really one of the greatest uh, resources uh, and assets that a person can have when it comes to building wealth. Um, and, and we're still so young and our life expectancy is 
I, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's pretty long. Um, and so we have a lot of time uh, to to build wealth. And if we start now, I think that's entirely possible uh, with even just moderate savings. I don't think we have to do anything crazy to play catch up. Uh, but if we start now, I think we'll end up in a good place. And, you know, I talk in the book about how there is this kind of us versus them narrative with uh, millennials and baby boomers and, and millennials kind of they look to the baby boomer generation and say, you had it so good. You're so lucky. It's not fair. Um, you know, and looking at the baby boomers now, actually, they're facing a retirement crisis. Uh, you know, they, they did. They were handed a good they, they were given a good hand, um, but they, they made a lot of behavioral mistakes kind of in general. They way undersaved. Um, they. They put a lot of faith in, in, you know, other institutions to provide for their future, whether it be social security or a pen company pension or a municipal pension. Um, and, and long story short, they just are way undersaved and they're retiring, you know, every day, more and more of them are, are entering retirement. A lot of them are going to live another 30 years. They'll be in retirement for 30 years and they frankly don't have the savings to, to continue continue their lifestyle for, for that time, probably not even close to it. So I kind of look, look at that and say, we really shouldn't be envying them. Instead, we should say, okay, what can we learn from that? And how can we um, look at what they did and behave differently so we end up in a better place uh, than they are now? And of course, a lot of this is generalizing. Um, but we kind of have to do that when we're talking about uh, such large groups of people. But, but I think generally that that's all true. I hear a lot of different definitions and meanings of financial independence thrown around. So I want to know what you mean when you say financial independence. What is financial independence to you? Yeah, it is something that's discussed a lot. And um, it's something I thought a lot about uh, when I was writing the book. And for me, financial independence means that you have a, a liquid net worth that is large enough to sustain your chosen lifestyle for the duration of your life without reliance on income or credit. Um, or, or you could say uh, streams of passive income, strong streams of passive income that are uh, enough to continue to sustain your, your lifestyle. Either way, uh, that's, that's what it means to me. And I think the, the core of that idea is um, that you're not beholden to anyone else um, for, for your own survival. And you don't have to work in a job that you don't enjoy. Um, you, don't, you kind of don't owe anything to anyone. Your time is your own and your money is your own. Oftentimes, I hear wealth or net worth being confused with income. A lot of people believe just because they make a lot of money, meaning that they have a large income, that they're wealthy and on their way to financial independence. That's not necessarily the case and actually often isn't the case. Talk to us about the difference between wealth and income. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I think a really good... Um, kind of explanation of this is it comes from the book, The Millionaire Next Door, which is a pretty famous old uh, personal finance book. And, and the, the authors of that book, when they were researching for the book, they found that there were more millionaires living in blue collar neighborhoods than in white collar neighborhoods. And they, they determined that that's, that was because uh, people in white collar neighborhoods, despite their higher incomes, uh, were more likely to spend their money on luxury items and wealth signifiers um, to the point where they weren't building wealth. And, and people in blue collar neighborhoods were, were just saving a lot more um, and, and building wealth. And they decided that people tended to fall into one of two groups. They are either under accumulators of wealth or prodigious accumulators of wealth. So, you know, under accumulators of wealth are people that have low net worths relative to their income. And prodigious accumulators of wealth uh, are people that have Oh, sorry, the opposite, um, high net worths relative to their income. Uh, and I see this all the time 
as a financial planner, you know, um, I've seen people who make less than a hundred thousand dollars a year become millionaires just through kind of consistent and disciplined saving and investing. Uh, and I've seen people that make a million dollars a year who barely have a positive net worth because of excessive spending um, and debt. Um, you know, having a high income, I think for, for most people does make it easier to save, you know, any given amount, especially a high amount. Uh, if you're a high earner, you should be able to cover basic living expenses and most emergencies that that pop up and still have money left over to spend and save. Uh, if you're a lower earner, uh, that is difficult, but that doesn't change the fact that, you know, everything I've seen, everything I've read, whether you're a high earner or a, or a lower earner, behavior is really the number one differentiator for those who build wealth. It's not income, it's behavior. I've shared this story a couple times on the show, but I really, I really like it. And for anybody that hasn't heard it, actually, when I worked back when I was a little bit younger, I worked at a credit union in college and I was one of those people that sit in the offices. So I was a financial service rep. And so I used to have people that would come in to me for various different reasons. Sometimes it was for loans, but other times it was for reimbursements of insufficient fund fees. And the number of times that I've had people come in and sit down in front of me and ask for their $30 overdraft fee to be reimbursed to me with a new iPhone in their hand, a new purse, or I see them drive up outside through my window in a nice new BMW or something fancy was way more common than people that didn't seem like they had money. And the other piece was too, and when somebody sits down to work with me, I of course had all their bank account information up in front of me so I could see what they had. And maybe that's not a full picture of everything that they owned, but very frequently it matched to exactly what you just said. The people that look like they had money very rarely did. And the people that didn't look like they had much usually had the most sitting in their bank account. Yeah, I totally believe that. It, it, they're, they are the millionaires next door. And I, that's one of my favorite books too. So absolutely no. <laughs> I know that book very, very well. You've created a five-step plan that you call a personal financial audit that you say can help anyone get onto the path of building true financial freedom. Walk us through the plan and describe the steps involved. I'll just start by outlining the five steps. So the five steps are confronting your financial reality, educating yourself, goal setting, making a plan to achieve your goals, and then finally ongoing tracking of where you are uh, relative to the goals. Um, and so to kind of just walk through those one at a time, the first step is confronting your financial reality. And high level, that the end of, of that step basically means you know your net worth and you know your cash flow situation. And I don't know, that might sound really simple, uh, especially to, to people who listen to this podcast, which I would guess are, are not your average um, people probably they're they're more highly financially literate. Um, maybe they they have a financial plan, they know their net worth, but I will tell you, most people do not know their net worth. They have no idea where their money is going. And that is a huge problem if you're trying to have a plan for going forward. It's not knowing where, where you're starting. Um, and so when I sit down with a client for the first time, I ask, how much do you have? How much do you owe? How much do you make? How much do you spend? And how much do you save? And a lot of times answering those questions takes some digging. Um, but once you can answer all of those, you get a great idea of where you are. Uh, and so that's really the first step. And um, the next step would be educating yourself. Uh, so if you know your net worth, you know where your money is going, but you don't know anything about investing and you don't know anything about debt reduction or, or cash flow planning or insurance, um, all these kind of really important parts of, of a good financial plan, you're, you're going to have trouble uh, making a plan to go forward in any sort of productive way. So however you do it, you know, maybe you substitute hiring a financial planner for this step, which is, is something a lot of people do. They delegate this step. Um, you know, you need to make sure you find someone ethical. Uh, who would be a fiduciary um, who only gets paid by you and isn't getting paid to sell you products. Um, but, but for most people who, who don't want to, who want to do it themselves, I would say you need to read a book, 
go online. There's a million resources out there. I try in my book to kind of add the middle, it's kind of the meat and potatoes, personal finance stuff that covers all these topics. Um, and I tried my best to kind of say, if you just read this book, you'll probably have a high level understanding of all the things you would need to know if you're an average person to write your own financial plan. Um, so, so one way or another, educate yourself. That's the second step. After that is goal setting. Uh, any good financial plan is, is based on goal setting. Uh, I really do believe that goal-based financial planning is the most effective and, and the most motivating uh, way to plan for people. Um, I, I think that for most millennials, your, your goal should be a very high net worth. That should be kind of your large macro goal. Um, now, specifically what your net worth target should be, that's highly personalized. That kind of depends on what your lifestyle costs. What, uh, you know, do you have a family? Um, a, a lot of things, but um, I, I do think that should be kind of the macro high level goal. Uh, and then as you drill down, you'll have to set more micro immediate kind of pre prerequisite goals to, to getting there. Um, so that's the third step. Uh, the fourth step is making a plan to achieve the goals. That's just writing, writing out a financial plan, a detailed, you know, multi-step financial plan for hitting the kind of more micro prerequisite goals along the way to achieving a high net worth, a, a net worth high enough to, to give you financial independence. And the last step is just ongoing tracking. Uh, that's really important. Um, you know, your financial plan, it shouldn't be a static snapshot of one day in your life, uh, of one static moment uh, of your finance, of your finances, a good plan kind of evolves and keep up, keeps up with your life. You know, we have kids, we switch jobs, we move, we buy houses, we sell houses, and on and on and on. And every time something like that happens, that that touches on your financial life in a big way. And your plan should take that into account and and evolve. Um, so I think at least every year. If not more, you should be revisiting your financial plan, sitting down and taking stock of everything, going through that, the, if you want, the five-step plan that I have, starting with, you know, revisiting your net worth, revisiting your cash flows, um, revisiting your goals, and then seeing where you are and seeing if you need to change the goals or uh, move the goalpost, whatever it is, um, and so that's the, that's kind of a, a long winded explanation of, of the five step personal audit. What are your favorite tools or resources for continuing that ongoing tracking? I think that's highly personal. I am not a nitty gritty budgeter. Uh, personally, I, I, I tend to be more high level and, and I have my own uh, financial plan format that I use for my family and for clients. Um, but I think for a lot of people who are doing it themselves, I think a good budget software is incredibly helpful for a lot of people. Um, like a, a budgeting software and a net worth tracker, whether you do it in a spreadsheet, which is, is really common, um, or whether you use some sort of aggregator. Um, you know, those are really popular. You can link all of your accounts um, and kind of see at any given point in time, what are your assets? What are your liabilities? Um, I, yeah, I, I think it just depends on what kind of person you are. Are you an engineer? Are you kind of like really into the dollars and cents? Or is that just going to make, is, is that just going to make you not even want to look at it? Because you're more of a big picture person. And you, I don't want to recommend any specific softwares because the truth is I haven't liked any of the ones I've tried which is why I have my own um my own financial planning format that I came up with myself. I think that's fair. I mean I use <laughs> I use this thing called a I, I basically a to-do list and I've looked all over the internet. I've bought in even like these journals that have to-do lists and none of them were just right for me. And so I ended up just creating my own. I probably tried a dozen different ones and I eventually said all right, I just need to create my own. And I did that. So I totally know where you're coming from. For software, I personally use Mint. 
it's not perfect. It works really well for me. I like it, but I don't use it exclusively. Uh, similar to you, I ended up creating my own Google Sheet that kind of, I used like kind of as a pair with Mint. But overall, I generally like Mint. Personal Capital is pretty good as well. Those are just kind of the two that I've used in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I I've also used Mint before, and it's not bad. It I think it it would be a great tool uh, for for ongoing tracking for a lot of people. Very recently, one of my all time best friends, who I actually lost touch with a little bit over the last year or two, reached out to me because he started to get interested in investing in personal finance. He never had any interest in it before. And I'm not really the type of person to push a conversation like that. So it just really never came up when he and I would hang out. But fast forward from when we used to spend a lot of time together to today, he's interested now and he wants to learn more. So he reached out to me. One of the things we talked about was how much money is needed in retirement. We talked back and forth about his amount for a few days. And then one day he came back to me and he said, my parents' financial advisor told them they need $200,000 to retire. Maybe lifelong pensions are involved and other sources of income. And I, and I know his parents, so I don't really think that's the case. But generally speaking, very, very rarely do I think that would be enough money for retirement. So I was quite surprised to hear that his parents' financial advisor would tell them that being a financial advisor, specifically a certified financial planner, what advice can you give someone who's trying to determine how much money they'll need to live their chosen lifestyle after retirement while maintaining financial independence? Yeah, I I agree with you. Uh, I think barring you know substantial income streams from other sources, that if all they if all they have to live on in retirement is two hundred thousand dollars, I would say they're they're in big trouble. Um, it yeah. I, I can't imagine a financial advisor that would would say that to somebody. Um, yeah. So one way of kind of gauging the adequacy of of retirement savings is is this financial planning rule of thumb. It's called the four percent rule. Uh, it's pretty popular. It's bandied about on the internet. It's been around for a while, and you know, like many things in in personal finance, people argue about it, they iterate on it, they go back and forth. I I think it's a really good rule of thumb. And it really is a rule of thumb. We're not trying to, you know, write in concrete um, a target retirement lump sum and then assume that someone's going to save that exact amount and take exact withdrawals every year for the rest of their lives. but I think it's a good rule of thumb for kind of roughly gauging adequacy um, of a retirement portfolio. So, so the rule, the 4% rule, it basically says, um, you know, if you have a lump sum invested in a balanced portfolio, uh, it can sustain withdrawals of around 4% for roughly 30 years without a high risk of, of being depleted. And so you can kind of take that and extrapolate. So for this couple with their $200,000 lump sum, a 4% withdrawal would be $8,000. So per that rule, they could withdraw roughly $8,000 a year uh, for for 30 years. And 30 years is kind of, I think, what we assume is, is a conservative estimate of retirement. Um, if you retire in your 60s, you live till your 90s. Um, so more or less, that that's why we make that assumption uh, when using that rule. Now, you know, if you have a longer period, a longer life expectancy, or you retire early, or whatever it is, um, then the the, withd- the rate you could withdraw um, while while not running a risk of running out of money is lower. Uh, they call that the safe withdrawal rate. So. For roughly 30 years, your safe withdrawal rate is 4%. If if we're talking about a period of 40 or 50 years that this lump sum needs to last, then the safe withdrawal rate might be 2 or 3%. Uh, if, it's, if it's a shorter period of time, let's say you're only going to live another 10 years and, and you're certain of this, well, then maybe you can take out, you know, 6%. Um, but, but it's just a good way of gauging. And yeah, $8,000 a year. It's not going to cover very much. So I, I don't know where, 
where their advisor got that number, but I, I disagree. Um, now they might be like a lot of baby boomers who are going to live mostly off of social security. Uh, that's, that's the majority uh, of baby boomers. They have very little saved and they'll live off social security for the rest of their lives. And, you know, for a lot of them, that's going to be tight because they're used to spending more, um, in their working years. And I do think that this is a really good example of how people tend to way overestimate how far a lump sum will stretch. Um, you know, using the 4% rule, you tell someone a million dollars, if you have a million dollars saved at retirement, which is a lot, that's a lot of money for, for the average person, you can spend $40,000 a year from that. Most people find that shocking. Um, if you're the average retiree, they say like a million dollars, I thought I could spend way more. Um, but that's just how the math works. Um, yeah, so I, I hope they have other streams of income. <laughs> when you say you could spend $40,000 a year, I agree that that doesn't sound like very much in comparison to the amount that you have saved. But now I wonder, do we need to think about this in a different lens? Maybe you're at retirement, so maybe you don't have a car loan anymore. Your car's paid off. Maybe you don't have a mortgage anymore because maybe your car's pay your house is paid off. You've been paying it off for 30 years over a mortgage. You don't really have to save anymore, right? Because you did all your saving and now you've hit your target. So you don't have any savings. So now, I mean, really, you have $40,000 free money to spend every year when you don't have to really consider those items. It's definitely not as much as you think when you have a million, but you take out all your biggest expenses. And I mean, that's a little under $4,000 a month to spend. I, I think that's a decent amount relatively because I think that's what the piece that people miss is that they might not have a car payment. They might not have a mortgage, et cetera. If you still have all those things, then yeah, $4,000 probably isn't a lot. But when you have roughly $4,000 a month and you don't have all those expenses, it could be enough for, for some people to live on, right? Is that at least how you're thinking yeah. of it? Are, are people usually having their cars and mortgages paid off or are they not? They should. Um, we, you know, rec we never recommend that, that someone retire if they have debt. Um, you should be debt free at retirement. You shouldn't be retiring with a mortgage. If that means selling your house and, you know, moving, okay. But um, so, yeah, I think to your point, that could be enough for some people. Um, you know, I have kind of extended relatives, they're retired teachers, and um, they, they live on, they've been living for a long time on, you know, roughly 40, $50,000 a year and they save. They don't need to save, but they save. Um, they live in, you know, a relatively inexpensive, they lived in a relatively inexpensive part of North Carolina and had, you know, no mortgage, no, no, drove old cars, um, didn't spend frivolously and, and they did fine. I think it. I think it really depends on the person. I think it depends on, you know, what kind of lifestyle are you accustomed to? Are you, if you're someone that was making, you know, 80,000 a year and, and spending most of it, or you're, let's say you're making a hundred plus and, and spending a substantial amount. And now you're expected to live on 40, that, that might be a different scenario. I also think it, it really matters where you live, uh, you know, cost of living, like here, here in DC, it, the cost of living is incredibly high. Uh, but where I grew up um, in Florida, it's, it's much lower. So I think someone there uh, would certainly be able to live comfortably on, on $4,000, whereas up here, it would be, it would be tricky. I'm going to assume that the million dollars and or the let me say the forty thousand that you would draw using the four percent rule is after tax. But let's just say, so let's just say that that's all out of a, a Roth account. When I was making one hundred twenty thousand, I, I don't have a W two job anymore. But when I did, I made at one point in my career, I made one hundred twenty thousand, and I lived in New Hampshire. I worked in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has income tax. Every month, the amount of money that I had left over after taxes and four hundred one k was about forty three hundred dollars a month. And I had a mortgage and a car loan and all of that at the time. So when you think about that, even though I made 120,000, my net pay, like actual cash, was little over 4,000. Whereas what we're talking about now is almost 4,000 a month. So 
I mean, it's really not that different between $120,000 salary and a $40,000 net pay that you're getting from your retirement accounts because you don't have to pay those taxes anymore. We're assuming that those have already been paid and you don't have all these other bills. Well, yeah, that and that is a huge consideration is, is this post-tax money or, or, or pre-tax money. Uh, for a lot of retirees, almost all the retire, retirement savings are in pre-tax accounts like a 401k uh, that, you know, maybe they'll roll it over to an IRA and then you say, and, and every dollar you withdraw is taxable, is taxable income. Uh, if be, having it, you know, having it after tax would be much better from a cash flow perspective. And that, that's a really big consideration uh, to your point. Why do you think misunderstanding the amount of money needed in retirement is such a common mistake people make, especially when we have a rule like the 4% rule? Well, I just think financial literacy is, is not that common. Um, like I said, when I first started working in finance, I didn't know anything about, about it. I knew nothing. I didn't know anything about investing. Um, and you know, I, I, I was a lawyer, you know, I, I just, I think that that's very common. Some of the most well-educated people I know really don't know much about personal finance. And, you know, we see all the time in our firm, we have really bright clients come our way and they have been taken advantage of by a wayward financial advisor who is just selling them financial products they don't need and ripping them off and they're shocked to find this out. They had no idea. Um, I think we should teach financial literacy in high schools. It's one of the most practical things that, that a person could possibly learn to, if you want to set people up uh, for later in life. I don't know why we don't do that. I think some, some high schools probably had that, but where I grew up, it certainly wasn't a thing. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's just a really low level of financial literacy in general amongst people here in the U.S., um, no matter how educated they are in, in other things. Many people look at retirement as one of their major goals, but you actually have a different outlook on it. Please explain how you view the goal of retirement and why shifting someone's mindset about retiring might be a smart decision for millennials who want to achieve financial independence. So I think that is a big, a big kind of distinction probably between the baby boomers and millennials, at least millennials I know. I myself, I never think about retirement. I just feel like if I ever, if I ever do retire, it will be really far off for me. Um, and most of my friends, they're so focused on, you know, raising their children and paying off their mortgage or, or student loans or whatever it is, retirement is just such a distant thought for them. Um, of course, there are exceptions. There's the whole fire movement, which, you know, I think a lot of millennials are, are a part of that. They're, they're like hyper-focused on, on retiring. Um, but the baby boomers, they lived for retirement. That was always the big thing. Retire at 65 and or retire, you know, the day that you're eligible for your, your full social security benefit at your social security retirement age, whatever that is. Um, and that was always kind of the end all be all goal, kind of regardless of what else was going on in their financial lives. It was just, I am retiring at 65 on the dot, no matter what. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think there's a lot of questions for them. It's okay. Are, are you going to have financial stability for the next 30 years or whatever your life expectancy is, you know, at, at the date of your retirement? But that really hasn't been a big part of the conversation. I think another question is, what are you going to do with your time after that? Um, you know, we work with a lot of retirees and, and what we've found is that for a lot of people, just stone cold retirement is not what it's imagined to be. Um, you know, people, people need a purpose. And so when people bring up, bring that up to us, young, healthy people who are able bodied, I'm going to stone cold stop working, you know, at 65 on the dot, we say, oh, okay, 
what are you going to do? Are you going to golf every day? Are, are you going to pursue another hobby? Are you going to travel? W- what are you going to be doing with your time? And, and, so, and a lot of people actually do know. And, and they, they've been thinking about this for a long time and they have it all planned out. Um, but a lot of, for a lot of people, that's kind of food for thought. And they think, you know what? Maybe full retirement isn't, isn't what I need. Maybe what I want is the option to retire. And, and my dad, um, you know, so there's the fire move, movement, financial independence, retire early. Those people, I guess, might spend, you know, 40, 50 years in retirement. And, and my dad instead says, FIRO, financial independence, retirement optional. And I think that's just a much better um, kind of goal for most people is not to be so hyper focused on this date at which you can retire, but to focus on a date at which you will have the option to retire and then reevaluate um, whether full retirement, just stone cold stop working, stop having an income is right for you. Or maybe you want to switch careers and do something that's a little less lucrative or a little more of a passion project or whatever it is. But um, I just kind of look to the baby boomers. And I think this hyper focus on just retirement in and of itself, without kind of looking at things more broadly, um, is kind of misplaced. It was created a little bit as a joke or, or completely as a joke, but it illustrates this point exactly. I saw a picture on the internet the other day, and it was this older couple. They were definitely probably in their 60s, if not 70s, retired. I believe they were on a roller coaster or some sort of like log ride at a, an amusement park. And they were both, it looked like they were sleeping on the roller coaster. And the caption of the photo basically said, this is why I don't want to wait until retirement to enjoy my life. And you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a joke, right? It's funny. It makes people yeah. laugh, but it's true. And I think a lot of millennials mm-hmm. are realizing that they don't want to be 50, 60, 70, when they finally decide to go travel the world or go do all these other things that they want to do. And I think that's partially going to change this definition of financial independence or fire or even just retirement in general. I think it's really going to change. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. I think, and I, yeah, I think it's just a more moderate approach. It doesn't have to be you know, work the live long day your whole life and then you stop stone cold at 65. Instead, maybe you just work a little less, but for a longer period of time. Um, take more time off when you're young and able-bodied. I mean, it, you know, if, if it's possible for you, but don't plan to just stop at, at any, you know, given point in time, especially when you might live another 30 years. Um, and so, yeah, I, I certainly think that, you know, the idea that we shouldn't be hyper-focused on retirement, I think that really ties in with living more today. I know for me personally, I'd rather take off a couple Thursdays and Fridays or a Monday, you know, quite a few times throughout the year if when I was working my W-2 job and then work until, you know, 70, as long as it's something I like, rather than, you know, like our boom, baby boomer parents did, work full 40, 50 hour week for 60 years up until they're 60 and then quit. Just like you said, I think there's a lot of people that agree with that. I think they'd rather take more time off now and then just Mm -hmm. work a little bit later because they know. And I think that partially comes down to being able to know that there's a lot more things that we can do these days that we actually enjoy working on rather than, Mm -hmm. you know, back then you were an accountant for 40 years and then you retired or you were an engineer for 40 years and you retired. Now, I mean, people do, I mean, can pretty much do anything they want. And so I think that's, changing it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that's a really big generational difference between, uh, I think between the baby boomers and millennials, I think we kind of looked to our parents and kind of that classic approach and, and said, you know, that's not for me. I want to travel now. I want to have fun. Um, you know, I don't want to be chained to my desk for, for 60 years and then golf twice a week for 30 years after that or, or whatever it is. Um, I, I think that a more moderate approach is certainly going to be more sustainable for us. I think just having a little more balance, I think that's the way to go. Millennials are frequently told that they should aim to save a certain percentage of their income based on their age. 
for example, if they're 25, they should save 10% of their income. Or if they're 30, they should save 15%. For many people, this kind of advice just isn't really actionable. What do you tell people who are struggling to increase their savings rate? I like to advice that um, Michael Kitsis gives. Michael Kitsis is, I don't believe he's well known outside of financial planning circles, but he's kind of like the rock star of the uh, financial planning world. And, and he frames this in a really good way. He kind of has made the point that um, for a lot of people, their savings rate is not a decision that they make. It's a default result of what's left over at the end of, you know, each month or year. And so for someone in that situation, telling them save 15% or save 20%, that's just not actionable for them. And it, it, it's not helpful. Um, and instead for those people, it really helps to kind of shift focus to their spending rate rather than their savings rate. Um, and kind of look at their spending rate because that's kind of within more within their control and say, how can we decrease your spending rate? So, you know, there, there's really three ways to do that. Um, one would be have them spend the same amount while earning more. Maybe they get a side hustle, um, increase their income in some way. Um, they could spend less while making the same amount. Or they can spend less while making more, um, which is obviously the most powerful of the three uh, strategies and you know how they're gonna how they go about spending less the specifics of that what they're gonna cut that's that just depends on the person um, how they're going to go about increasing their income I don't know that that's that's up to them but but though but I think the the important thing here is that you focus on the spending rate. And then kind of within that, there is a debate of, well, is it the latte factor? Um, should they stop having takeout coffee on their way to work? Um, is it the little things or the big things? And I'm kind of solidly in the camp of, of focusing on the big things, um, like housing and transportation. I think little things are important for happiness. I think for a lot of people, you know, if you tell someone, live in an expensive house, but you can't have takeout coffee or, or whatever it is. You, you can't buy lunch a few times a week. That can basically lead to frugality fatigue, I think, where it's just not sustainable. Um, they're, not, they're not happy. They feel deprived. So they don't stick with it very long. Whereas it's really easy to, to decide, you know what? I'm going to live in a less expensive place. I'm going, to, I'm going to drive a less expensive car, make one or two bigger decisions that kind of take away a thousand little decisions that you would have to make. And then you can continue to enjoy, you know, little pleasures in life and kind of have, have more normality. Um, so, so yeah, I think my advice to people who need to focus on their spending rate for most people to sum it up, it would be focus on the big things. Look at, Look at your really big costs. Um, and is there anywhere you can move the needle on that? And if so, that might be all you need to do. I know that these savings rules were created to be helpful, but do you think it's possible that they're actually doing more harm than they do good? And similar to the savings rate rules, I hear people talking about different benchmarks of net worth that people should have by certain ages. Are these types of benchmarks hurting more than they're helping too? So I think the spend, uh, saving and spending rules, like, you know, if you're in your 20s, try to save 15%. If you're in, the, in your 30s, try to save 20%, whatever. I don't think those are doing more harm than good. Um, I mean, I, I could certainly see an argument that, that, that could be made um, against them that they're not totally productive for everyone. Um, but, but I think that they can be useful for kind of setting a minimum bar and giving some context to cash flow planning. Um, I think without some sort of rules, we're just kind of operating in the dark. Now for net worth, net worth benchmarks, I think that's kind of a different issue. I think that that is, whereas telling someone to save a certain percentage of their income, you can kind of say that to, to a broad swath of people. But 
um, I think telling someone, okay, you should have X net worth by X age. I just think net worth targets are so much, should be so much more individualized than that. It really depends on uh, how much you want to spend and, and what your lifestyle is and what your cost of living is and, and where you live and all these things. I think um, that is, is a much more individualized thing. I don't think you can generalize as much about that. I've asked this next question of a few guests in the past, but longtime listeners of the show know I love to get different viewpoints on the same topics so we can all learn different points of view. So should millennials prioritize saving and investing over reducing debt or should they focus on their debt first? Well, I'll say right off the bat that um, if you have access to a uh, workplace retirement plan that offers you a match, uh, for, for contributions, that's free money. Um, and I would say most people, if possible, regardless of, of debt situation, unless it's really bad, um, should certainly uh, invest enough to get the match. Uh, let's say they'll match you know, your contributions up to 3% of salary um, or, or 5%, whatever it is, then you should contribute at least that much because it is free money. And if you invest it well, it will you know, grow nicely over the long term and, and, and set you up well for the future. That aside, the way I kind of like to look at this question of, of debt reduction versus investing is by asking a few questions. Um, so the, if you have debt, the first question that I would ask is, does it bother you? Does it keep you up at night? Are you a really debt averse person? Um, I know a lot of people like this, having any debt, even at an incredibly low interest rate, it keeps them up at night and, and they just can't deal with having it. If that's you, I would say pay it off. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's at 1%. Um, and I know a lot of people would disagree with me on this. They would say that doesn't add up. Um, but I really think peace of mind is priceless. I think at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to optimize for, for happiness here. And if you're, if you're staying up at night over this, I, I think pay it off. That that's number one. Um, now if you have debt and it doesn't keep you up at night, it doesn't really bother you that much. The next question is, is it high interest debt or is it low interest debt? Um, so What's high interest versus low interest? We could, you know, debate about this, but for, for the sake of, of coming up with a framework, I like to say if it's at 4% or less, I would call that relatively low interest debt. And anything above 4%, I think we're starting to get towards what I would call higher interest debt. Um, so if, it, if you have debt, it doesn't bother you and it's low interest, aka roughly 4% or below, then I think an argument can be made for investing, taking extra cash and investing because with debt at, let's say, three and a half percent, I think, you know, it's likely you might make a better return than that by investing extra cash in the stock markets over the long term. Um, but if we're looking at higher interest debt, so let's say you have student loans at 6%, I think it's a lot less likely at that point that you are going to do better. I mean, you probably still could, but it's a lot less likely, right? That you'll do better over the long term by investing extra dollars than you would by putting them down on the debt. And, and the thing about putting money down on debt is that every dollar you put down gets a guaranteed return. So if you're, if you put it, any dollar you put down on, you know, debt at 6%, that's a guaranteed return of 6%. Whereas uh, returns when you're investing in, in stock market and real estate, whatever it is, they're not guaranteed. Um, and, and so that's kind of the way I look at it is, is these four questions. One, you know, does it keep you up at night? Two, well, okay, so it's not four questions, but the questions are one, does it keep you up at night? Uh, two, what's the interest rate? And kind of going through the matrix within uh, the answers to those questions. And, and that's exactly how I think about it. I have met one of the coolest parts about having the podcast is I've met a lot of really awesome people. And I've met somebody that I consider a friend. And he is completely Dave Ramsey style 
zero debt, no matter what the interest rate is, no debt, no debt, no debt. And I'm just not that way. Personally, I have a car loan. It's at like 1.25% or like 1.5%. And I just, I could never get myself to pay that off quickly. Like I'm obviously making the monthly payments that I'll pay it off eventually, but I just, I can't get myself to pay that off rapidly because it's just so low. And I know if I had $50, it's better invested than it is to pay down that loan. So for me, I generally don't get kept up at night for debt. I'm pretty conservative as a person, but just having a little bit of debt, low interest debt like that, I don't have anything above 5%. Even my mortgage is 2.25%. So like those types of things, I just can't imagine paying that down early. So for me, I don't lose sleep at night. So I'm fine with having the debt, but I totally understand that it's, it's a lot more psychological than I think a lot of people think. And I know for me, for a long time, I didn't think about the behavioral or psychological piece at all. I just said purely, if I can invest higher than that rate, then I'm investing. And if I can't, then I'll pay it down. But then I learned of the more psychological approach that you mentioned. And I think that's really valuable. And I think a lot of people need to definitely take that into consideration. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the I, I think the quantitative part's important, of course, but it, it you know, it's not just a quantitative decision. There's qualitative um, factors at play too. And I think happiness should always be a consideration um, when you're thinking about things like this. I love listening to podcasts, reading books, articles, and really all kinds of things like that. But I've learned over the last few years that it's more important to take action on those things than it is to consume more of those things. So before someone listening to this episode continues on to the next episode in their podcast player, what is one action they should take after listening to this show? Uh, I guess broadly speaking, I would say start now. Start now. Um, getting on the path to financial independence kind, kind of broadly. And the, I would say the first thing that you should do if you haven't already uh, to get on that path is, is figure out your net worth, figure out where you are, uh, take a look at everything. And, and I think for a lot of people, that's the best place to start and um, go from there. As we wrap up the show, I want to give you a chance to tell the audience where they can go to connect with you, learn more about all the concepts we talked about. Where's the best place to find you? Yeah, uh, I'm not super active uh, on, on social media, but I do have a uh, Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Rachel Podnos. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, Rachel Podnos O'Leary, and uh, my firm's website. So, so my firm is Wealthcare LLC, and our website is www.wealthcarellc.com. I'll be sure to put links to all those resources in the show notes below. Rachel, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. All right, guys. So that wraps up my conversation with Rachel Podnos O'Leary. And as I mentioned in the intro, we do have two guests in today's episode. So this back half of the conversation is going to be with Clay Stackhouse. Welcome to the show, Clay. Hi, Robert. Good to be with y'all. Thank you. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So I had a great, uh, very exciting career in the uh, Marine Corps. I was in the Marines for uh, 25 years, actually. I'm, I'm a retired Marine colonel. And uh, so I've actually, I've been a member of Navy Federal since 1986. And uh, uh, so I, I certainly know Navy Federal's membership. Uh, I did a bunch of combat contingency stuff. I flew helicopters. I actually flew Marine One for President Clinton and, and uh, President Bush. And uh, yeah, I had a great career. And when it was, it was done, I tell people I'm I'm done chasing bad guys, and now I wanted to help the good guys. So as a as a retired colonel, I figured you know those people I worked with all that time in the military, I figured I could help financially, and I just I snatched lightning by getting with Navy Federal right when I got out of the Marine Corps. Uh, I'm the regional outreach manager in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. I work out of Pensacola, and basically, I talk to the people we're talking to today, honestly, a lot of millennials who are just getting into the military or recent veterans and their families about their finances. I'm a certified financial education instructor, uh, and I talk to them about Navy Fellow and how we can help them. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's been very rewarding. 
Uh, and I've actually learned a lot doing it as well, which I think we're going to cover some of the topics here today. Well, first and foremost, thank you very much for your service. Greatly appreciated. It, it was my pleasure to tell you the truth. Very adventuresome. How did you get interested in finance? I mean, there's so many different paths you could have gone when you got out of the military to help people. So why finance? Right. So that's a great question because everybody, that touches everybody, right? And through all that time in the Marine Corps, honestly, I saw uh, some really good guys. Uh, we, we'd go into deployments. Uh, sometimes uh, marriages didn't work out or sometimes uh, they'd have things repossessed and I'd see them get into financial difficulty and it, and it would really affect their, their careers and their lives. So I know that it's something everyone wants to be financially uh, sound, right? I mean, if you have your finances squared away, there's a calmness that comes over you and you're able, you're able actually to function better. I think I'm a better husband. Uh, you know, I, I like doing this job with Navy Federal and my finances are squared away. And it, it's just, it's, it's really a pleasure. And, and honestly, I go into a lot of different places, say in rural Mississippi or Louisiana, and I talk with some of these kids who've, who've never really had anybody, I say kids, they're 17, 18, 19, 20, who've never had anybody sit down with them and say, do you know what a credit score is? Right? Uh, do you know what makes up a credit score? Do you know why you don't want to run up credit card debt, but you still actually need a credit card uh, in order to create a credit store score? Those things no one actually ever has talked to them about. So uh, Navy Federal helps right do that all the time, but I'm actually the voice who goes out, out there and I'm able to sit down with them and help them. Uh, and and it, it helps me sleep at, my, at night to tell you the truth that. Uh, I'm helping those people who say they'll support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. For me, that's that's less than one percent of the population. Uh, I put my life on the line with people like that. And so I think they deserve good financial advice. So we're really happy to give it to them. I think that's a piece of finance that is often overlooked. People that go into careers that aren't finance focused, they don't think about how finance impacts the rest of their lives. I mentioned, I mean, you mentioned your better husband, you have a happier life. That's because you don't have the stress from finance. If you don't have your fin personal finances in order, there's a stress, even if you're not thinking about it, even if you're at a, let's just say you're at a family barbecue and you're not thinking well, you're about right. your personal finances, it's, it's right. It's there. It's in you subconsciously, you know, and it's just, right. you have that burden weighing on you. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely true. So why not, like everything else they did in the military, right? Attack it. Attack it with, uh, with knowledge, um, with a good education about your finances, and just some basic good practices. I think uh, for millennials, especially, I, I talk to, so Navy Federal, right, is, is military veterans and their families, right? So I talk to a lot of people who aren't military, but like my brother is in the Navy, you know, they would tell me. So they're in our field of membership. We're actually the largest credit union in the world. Uh, you know, that uh, credit unions obviously aren't banks. Banks are in business to make money. Uh, we are in business to help our members, right? It's, it's financially like-minded people who make a financial family. That, that's that's a, a credit union. Navy Federal just happens to be the, the largest credit union in the world because we serve the United States military veterans and families, right? So, uh, um, when I, when I think about, um, who we're helping and I sit down with them and I talk to them about some very basic things like get a financial organization that you trust, right? They, a lot of them don't eat. Well, I know Jimmy works at a bank downtown. How about them? Well, that's not really what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about get a, get a savings and a checking account, right? And then pay yourself first. Think of that. You're, especially if you're in the military, the first day you get in the military is the least you're ever going to make because you get more seniority, more time and grade, you get more designations and you get paid for that. So I say even a small uh, allotment into a savings account uh, for you or for your children uh, is going to yield great big dividends along the way. So what I'd say to these, these millennials is get into those habits early on, right? And, and, uh, by the time you're a 53 year old man, like I am, you're going to be able to uh, relax and reap the rewards, I think. 
One of the very first things that happened in my personal financial life was that my grandma helped me open a bank account at a local credit union when I was only 14. I'm not Woo-hoo! sure I'm not sure if she chose a credit union because she knew the benefits of them over banks or if it was just because the company that she used to work for at the time had their own credit union. But either mm-hmm. way, that tiny little detail has had a massive impact on my life because I ended up working at a credit union years later which ended up teaching me about personal finance and really has just molded everything that I've done to this day. What I didn't realize until the last few years is how few people actually know the difference between credit unions and traditional banks. So I want to start by talking about that. What are the benefits of credit unions over banks and what makes them different? Right. I alluded to that a little bit earlier when I said banks are in business to make money. And that's, that's not a joke. Uh, you, you're going to look at fees and things like that at a bank. And a, like in 1933, Navy Federal was a bunch of Navy officers in D.C. who got together and they pulled their resources, right? And uh, at first it was just those guys, but they pulled the resources so that everybody there was in that financial family. Now we've grown to over 10 million members, right? It's a much larger pool, but we're still just drawing from the same a uh, pile of money. It's everybody's in this together so that everything that we do is to serve our members. So the idea of, ch- of charging fees uh, on accounts seems counterintuitive because if you're helping everybody and it's just uh, one big pile of money that you're working with, uh, you wouldn't want to do that. That's, that's not helping your members. All of our accounts yield interest, actually. You know, I'll tell you, in the Marine Corps, I, so I thought I was doing pretty well. I was uh, deploying, um, but I wasn't focused on my finances like I am now. And I have since moved my uh, savings and checking accounts into different accounts whereby I have to keep a little bit higher balance in the account, but it yields much more money. It's things like that that uh, a credit union is going to help you do and look out for you. Uh, Navy Federal has free financial counseling. Right. You can call a person, make an appointment and it's just free and they're on they're on uh, salary. So they're not there to kind of just broker a bunch of Navy federal programs They're They're there to look at your finances. I did that when I got out of the Marine Corps and I did. I rearranged a couple of things um, to give me a little bit more peace of mind. But it's that financial family, which I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, you took advantage of and your experience um, with a credit union uh, that sets us apart. Yeah, I believe the credit union that I'm part of these days is like the fifth or maybe sixth or seventh largest in the world. So not quite as big as, as Navy Federal, but they're up there. And you, you mentioned that it doesn't really make sense to charge fees to their members because credit unions are owned by their members. And so right. if the institution charges a fee to their members, they're essentially that money that they make is going back to the members. So it doesn't really make sense from a, an that's ownership a, that's perspective. That's a great way to put it, Robert. Well Whereas said. from for fin- uh, financial institutions, they're typically and not always, but a lot of them are publicly traded. They have shareholders. They have, you know, they have Wall to Street make to, money for their shareholders. Exactly. Right. So it exactly. does make sense for them to charge fees. Exactly. One of the requirements, though, of joining a credit union that banks don't have is that you usually have to fit into the credit union's field of membership. You briefly have touched on this with the Navy Federal, you know, helping the military. Wow. Mm -hmm. Explain how fields of membership work at credit unions, why it exists, and how it's handled more in depth at Navy Federal. So if you're financially like-minded people, you know, a credit union, you've probably heard of teachers' credit unions or police agencies. So we just happen to be uh, the greatest military, in in my opinion, in the history of the world that we serve, right? The, The American military veterans and their families. So if you think just of that group, Robert, 250,000 people just transition out of the American military uh, each year. So in four years, a million people are new veterans who either they were uh, eligible for our membership while they were in the military or learning about our membership as they transition out. So a lot of people wonder about if the size of a credit union is going to be a detriment to them because they're, they serve specific groups of people 
we just happen to have a very large group of people, which puts us, you know, over 10 million members in the largest credit union in the world. So I, I think you kind of get the best of both worlds with Navy Federal. Why do these fields of membership even exist? Why can just anybody join a credit union? Huh. Why does, do these field memberships exist? I don't know, to tell you the truth. That's a, that's a good one. I should look that up. But we, um, uh, I, I guess you gravitate to the family that you're from, right? Uh, if I were a teacher, perhaps I'd be in a, in a teacher's credit union or something like that. I just spent my, enti- my entire life in the military. I knew Navy Federal well. I knew their field of membership very well and love them because I've seen them deploy and sacrifice across the world. So uh, I think maybe I don't know the reason for it to exist, but I certainly take advantage of the fact that it does exist because I still get to serve, you know, with the people uh, that I've spent my entire life with. I mean, I graduated from high school and I think a week and a half later, uh, I went to the U.S. Naval Academy, so I didn't have a very long summer vacation, and I get the I got the rude awakening of what they call plebe summer there. But since then, you know, this has been my family. Uh, so, you know, I think it's you can take advantage of the family uh, that you're used to, and and for me, it's military veterans and their families. One downside I hear from people about credit unions is that they're usually only local. That isn't necessarily the case with Navy Federal, but for a lot of credit unions, they're only local. And people see that as a bad thing in case they travel or whatever the case is. Then I go on to explain to them because I worked at one, so I kind of know the ins and outs of what shared branching is. And nearly everyone that I tell shared branching to has been quite surprised. Explain what shared branching is and how it allows members of smaller financial institutions like credit unions to compete with big banks like Bank of America? Well, so we don't do that. We have 317 branches at Navy Federal all over the world, right? I've been to uh, Navy Federal in Spain. I like to tell the story where, uh, uh, for whatever reason, I found myself on the continent of Africa a fair amount in the Marine Corps. uh, And I went to uh, the capital city of Djibouti, Africa, which is Djibouti. So I got off the plane in Djibouti, Djibouti, Africa, right? And I was kind of sifting through uh, all that's there uh, to get to my luggage. And I saw, whoa, there's a big French Foreign Legion guy in his uniform and everything. I thought, why is there a French Foreign Legion guy there? Well, there's an active French Foreign Legion post in Djibouti. Do you know what else is in Djibouti? A Navy Federal Credit Union. (laughs) And I went there too. So not only are we all over the world physically, Uh, But our online presence, um, and I love going to branches. As a matter of fact, here I'm in Pensacola. We had Hurricane Sally last year. I had to get the insurance uh, check squared away, and I couldn't just take a picture. I actually had to bring it to a branch. Uh, So it was really convenient to have a branch right here. Um, Yeah, and they're all over the world, but overwhelmingly, I use my online uh, things at Navy Federal. Uh, which kind of puts us uh, all over the world using the World Wide Web. Yeah, that's one of the other pieces that I tell people too, is if they're worried that they don't have a branch locally to where they live or where they're moving because of their credit union being small and local, there's technology. And I very rarely go into a branch now, not because I don't want to, I just don't have a need to because of technology and all the different things that are available. So it's like, even if your branch isn't there, I mean, there's banks that are purely only online. So clearly people can get by without having branches locally. And Robert, I, I deal with that a lot with, uh, I said before, I go into um, like a Monroeville, Alabama, or, um, you know, some areas in Mississippi where they belong to a small financial institution because their parents did and their parents did. And I tell them, look, pretty soon, you know, you are going to be an international man or woman of mystery and you're going to find yourself in a place like Kuwait uh, or Germany or Korea and uh, Navy Federal is going to be able to help you there. Um, so that, that's a jump. But once I once I get them to understand that, uh, again, it's it's very rewarding. As with nearly any business or industry, there are some that are better than others. If someone listening to the show today is interested in joining a credit union, 
what are the things they should look out for? What red flags do they want to be aware of? Well, uh, so trust. And when you say trust, it's not like I know Jimmy because he works at the bank. I'm talking about uh, uh, online security is a huge deal that you can research uh, the financial institutions. We talked about fees. You don't want an institution who's going to charge you uh, fees, right? Uh, I do all sorts of research beforehand uh, for, for an institution like Navy Federal. It's, it's You're pretty well known. I think you may be alluding to a, a smaller financial institution, maybe closer to home or something like that. But uh, yeah, word of mouth, especially, uh, we did talk about the fact that uh, people's finances affects everyone. So if there's something going on that's not good, you're going to be able to find out probably. So look into them prior, right? And establish some trust. Uh, know that they have uh, not only an online presence, but an online security apparatus that's going to keep your finances safe. Um, there's things like that, that uh, uh, the, the amount of interest that you're going to yield. You can go on NavyFederal.org and look how much more uh, I, I went from a everyday savings to a money market savings account. So I'd ask your listeners, go and take a look and see the two rates. And uh, you can see how much more I'm yielding in that savings account uh, now. And I'm embarrassed to tell you, I was in, uh, I have to keep a higher balance like I alluded to, which I'm able to do now, but I was gonna be able to do that for a, a while while I was still in the Marine Corps. But I just wasn't looking uh, online at the financial uh, opportunities that uh, Navy Federal gave me. So, uh, you know, I'd say continue to check quarterly. I go back, look at specials that they're having, uh, running uh, any number of things like uh, move credit card debt from one institution over to this. I know we've run things like that before, but there's any number of different uh, promotions I know we do at Navy Federal and, and different organizations do. Ensure you're taking advantage of those things. So I guess what I'm saying, Robert, is uh, be engaged with your finances. Don't just let it happen to you, right? Be engaged because it's something that is not going to go away. It's not going to, I can't wait till I'm 62. I'm not going to have to worry about money anymore. That, that's just not going to happen. So continue to stay engaged. Set that good foundation, you know, uh, when you, when you start out so that you have options as you get older. I think it's pretty clear that you and I both love credit unions. I've mentioned it. I use them for all of my personal banking and I use it for my businesses as well. Mm -hmm. But I admit that they're probably not perfect for everyone. So who might a credit union not be well for? Yeah, I thought, okay, um, if you don't, if you want to get charged uh, higher rates and you want uh, your financial institution uh, to make money off of your accounts instead of treat you like a family member, it's for that person, in my opinion. So I'm wholly and completely biased uh, for credit unions. I, you're not really going to be able uh, to give me uh, any argument why I wouldn't uh, stay with them. So I'm look people who, who aren't looking for the best deal. How's that? I know we have quite a few service members and family members of service members who listen to our show. So I'd like to talk a bit about the specifics of personal finance for military members. What is unique about personal finance for military members? Yeah. So now that Robert is hitting at the 10 ring with who I talk to when I go talk to these new, you know, uh, soldiers, sail sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, uh, about now. Okay, now I'm in the military, right? I'm getting paid on the 1st and 15th of every month. Uh, I have my medical taken care of. I have my dental taken care of. Uh, you have a room and board taken care of, right? Uh, so making that adjustment, not only, not only the adjustment to the way you live your life, but financially, uh, you need to uh, break from being a civilian and all the different things that you thought you needed as a civilian, right? And start thinking a little more simply. So I talked about that first thing, and they usually help you when you first get into the military, finding a financial institution you can trust. Uh, because, you know, we don't want our servicemen to be in financial difficulty. It, it makes them an unhappy force. So uh, we usually get that squared away. Once we do that, 
uh, we need to uh, establish the accounts we're in, which is pretty simple, right? A good checking account and a good savings account, right? Once we do that, we just get a budget. Now, here's the thing, and it's not, it's not uh, rocket science, but you have to sit down and figure out how much is coming in and how much needs to go out, right? Avoid the credit card debt. Avoid the credit card debt. It's terrible. It's just terrible. Once you get that good budget going on uh, and you, I always say, pay yourself first. So you have some allotments going in uh, and you get those accounts to where they need. That last step for me is start to invest, right? And, and investing is any number of different things that revolves around risk. But if you, if you can't pay your bills uh, from the beginning, if you're worried about uh, paying the light bill and putting groceries on the table, then investing it seems like a, a bridge way too far, right? So if, if you ensure you know what's coming in and you know what you're spending your money on, you make that good budget where you're sending an allotment uh, to an account, right? You get it to, I say it's three months pay is what I say in there. You use the 80-20 rule as well, right? So I'm living on 80% of what I make and I'm saving 20%, right? So if I'm putting that 20%, let's just say into a a good savings account at Navy Federal that, that yields interest. You want to get that to a certain amount, and then you can start talking about investing. And like I said, we have a free 888-842-6328. You can call that, and you can get free investment advice. And then that now, now we're cooking with gas, because at that point, they're, they're going to say, okay, what kind of risk do you want? Do you want high risk or low risk? Uh, millennials can afford to have some risk. So let's Let's start having fun with investing money. All that comes, though, after you make a solid foundation of knowing what's coming in, trusting that financial institution, and creating a budget, right? Are these things overly exciting? And No, not really, but it, it's something you need to do because once you get toward the other end of it, and I can call my father and talk about what investments he has and what he recommends, I do kind of enjoy that. Because uh, we're on that end of it, but uh, you know, you build the house on a on a solid foundation, and and that's getting that thing you can trust, the right accounts, and a good budget from the beginning. What challenges do service members face when building savings that civilians don't necessarily deal with? Well, yeah, the uh, moving constantly. It's called PCSing, permanent change of uh, station. Uh, moving is difficult. Uh, it incurs costs often um, just, uh, well, I saved a lot of money when I was deployed. Uh, but remember, usually, especially in a service, a sea service like the Marine Corps, uh, one family member is deploying and the other family uh, is still at home, right? So keeping that uh, functioning while one family member is gone. And even though I was saving a lot of money, when I, like when I was in Iraq, you know, we were getting shot at, we weren't taking any liberty, you know, so I wasn't going to restaurants, obviously, or anything like that. But uh, my family was back in North Carolina. Uh, and, you know, they were still living their lives. Uh, so, you know, the family separation, uh, moving a lot, all those things provide challenges. But overwhelmingly, I, I wouldn't have stayed in the Marines for 25 years you know, if I thought the, the rewards did not outweigh the challenges, I, I certainly just uh, enjoyed it. Uh, and it's, it's nothing that can't be overcome. You just need to be aware of the challenges. Uh, and like you, you did everything else in the military, uh, face them head on uh, and overcome them. At least in my experience, credit unions are typically quite a bit more open to working with newer borrowers for car loans and credit cards. Talk to us a bit about how credit unions can help people get started on the right foot using these types of products. Well, so I alluded to family, right? So you're in a financial family. Once you uh, uh, make the, uh, all the requirements for membership, uh, we feel like at Navy Federal, because you're a, a military veteran or family member, uh, we kind of don't find that a very, uh, well, I, I think it's easy for us to be able to um, approve loans very quickly. As a matter of fact, um, I just got, it was my get out, of, uh, get out of the service gift to myself. I always wanted this big 
four wheel drive pickup truck that I've wanted since I was a kid. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to buy this now. And uh, I'd been, because I've been with Navy Federal, um, I'm in this credit union who considers me their financial family. Uh, I got on, I called them and I think I was approved. I don't know. It was like 15 minutes or something like that. So uh, it is easier um, because we consider it uh, that financial family. I remember when I worked at the credit union, I actually was the one decisioning these loans. I was the loan officer. So I was doing the underwriting. And I had some friends that were underwriters at financial institutions that were not credit unions. And we would talk about different requirements and things like that. And it seems that credit unions tend to have a little bit more, I don't want to say relaxed, but for lack of a better word, relaxed lending guidelines than do regular financial institutions. So I think that's a piece of it as well. Well, and, um, you know, I, I keep falling back on this idea of a financial family. Uh, and, I, and Navy Federal actually is the only credit union I've ever been with. I've been with them since 1986. So, uh, and, and that's what I can speak for. Uh, and I, I certainly do. It's that, that feeling of family. They want, they want to help me financially. And they've shown me that over and over and over again. Uh, I'm not a number to them who's generating a dividend that they can give to their shareholders. I'm in their military family. And because of that, uh, I, I think that uh, that truck loan I got was, I mean, like a no-brainer. It was an easy thing to, uh, to get accomplished. There's two things I want to note about that. One, it was quick because of everything you just mentioned, but it was also quick because you had your personal finances in order. It wouldn't have been as quick if you didn't have a strong... I mean, you talked about it. You have to have a strong personal uh, financial base. You have to have a strong credit score, et cetera. If you didn't already have those things, it doesn't matter what financial institution it is, it's not going to be quick. But you did those things ahead of time. So that helped you be able to do that. And the second thing I want to mention is we're talking a lot about Navy Federal here, which is field of membership of the military. But there's a lot of credit unions out there. You mentioned teachers, police. I mean, there's a bunch. We have one here mm-hmm. where I live in New Hampshire that's just for New Hampshire residents. And so there's a bunch of these different types of things. So don't think that you can't be in a credit union if you're listening to this just because you're not in the military or you no know, family members that are in the military. There are likely credit union options in your area that you would fit into the field of membership. Right. And, and that's a great point, Robert. I just remember uh, I'm, I'm speaking from my area of expertise and I'm, I'm a Navy federal guy. So that's what I know of credit unions. When it comes to financial planning, everyone's situation is different. And being in the military adds an additional variable to that equation. What considerations must be taken into account about financial planning for service members? Uh, so that fa- family dislocation, obviously, uh, and the, the deployments. I think uh, you have to ensure, like, say you're a single person and uh, you're going to Afghanistan for a year. Um, what are you going to do with your car? You know, what are you going to sell your house? Were you renting a house? Or do you need to rent that house out? Um, if you do rent that house out, do you have uh, do you have a um, somebody who can look after it for you? Um, there, there are a lot of things like that, which overwhelmingly have to do uh, with the, the deployments. Um, so uh, filling in for those things, it can be a good thing. I mean, I deal with uh, a lot of the recruiters I deal with are like sergeants first class, which is an E7 or staff sergeants, which are an E6, which are have been in the military, you know, say 10, 12 years and had several duty stations. And a lot of them own in places like, you know, near uh, Fort Rucker or around Norfolk and uh, Jacksonville, where there's big Navy bases. Uh, have bought properties and then uh, rented them out and used them uh, as as an income generator. A lot of those have done that. So it kind of goes both ways with the, uh, there are things that you need to do to prepare for, like storage and uh, um, things like that. But there are also things that where you can reap benefits, like every time you do get a different, like the house I'm in right now, I bought in 2007. Uh, which was when I, I was stationed here in Pensacola for a while. Uh, and then we moved and rented it out for a little bit. Oh, that was tough. <laughs> um, but we did that. And, and now we're back in it uh, forever. So, um, you know, it, it kind of goes both ways. What made that experience tough? 
So um, when you rent a property, uh, you just hope that the renters are going to take care of it the way you would. Uh, this is a house built in 1903. Uh, and my wife loves it dearly. I love it, but my wife really loves it. Uh, we were lucky. We had military people uh, in here, actually, and both of them uh, took care of it very well. So although my worry was unfounded, uh, I did used to worry when uh, we were out of here and renting it. For anyone listening to the show today, whether they're a service member or not, what are your top budgeting tips? How can a credit union be used in conjunction with those tips? Yeah, so uh, especially for millennials, guys, stay away from the credit card debt, okay? I've alluded to the fact that you have to get with a financial organization that you trust. Robert and I are both very high on credit unions. So look into that, check into them, ensure it's, it's the right one for you, okay? And then get into the right accounts. Uh, Navy Federal is gonna have several different checking and savings accounts that you can set up. So that's fine, study them online and ensure you're doing the right thing. Then you have to set up that budget. Know what's coming in, know what's going out, okay? And you gotta stick to the budget. And then once you do that, look into investing. Okay, that recipe, I actually, uh, if you Google Clay Stackhouse, I think the article I wrote is uh, financial fundamentals will always work. Uh, and <clears throat> excuse me, as I went around <clears throat> to all of these uh, different young people and talked to them, I realized those are some things that a lot of them honestly didn't know and had told them before. Uh, and they were just kind of stumbling through uh, their financial life without actually taking control of it. And I don't think it, it needs to be as complicated uh, as a lot of people think. It's, it's, it's really simply um, not spending more than you make, sticking to that budget, right? And, and your credit card debt can spiral out of control. Uh, or, and overwhelmingly, when I talk to a 20, 21, 22-year-old, they're saying, uh, Clay, how, how do I get rid of the financial the credit card debt. You know what? But that's okay. It's never too late. Once you acknowledge that happens, guys, it's just getting down to a budget. It's just, uh, you know, uh, stubby pencil work. It may take longer. You may have to spend less and save more for a period of time, but it's a simple equation, which will eventually get you out of that debt uh, by following that budget. And then you know, if you're at Navy Federal, you can call that financial advisor and say, hey, look, man, I'm in terrible credit card debt. What do I do? Uh, we have delinquency control counselors, right? Um, there, there is help. So that's probably, so I'm kind of all over. I'm sorry, but it, it's that check, that, get that good financial institution, right? Get into the right accounts, create that budget, stay out of credit card debt, uh, and then begin to invest, Okay. Um, now, credit cards are something you're going to need to generate a credit score. I use the, uh, um, it's the E-Rewards, I think. Go Rewards, the Go Rewards card I use. I get triple points back on restaurants and fuel. And that's virtually all we use the credit card for. And then every time we get a statement, we just pay the credit card off, right? So we're continuing to show potential lenders that uh, we are good for credit, which drives a credit score up. Um, but don't get into credit card debt because that can bury you. As we wrap up the show, I want to give you a chance, Clay, to tell the audience where they can go to learn more about you and the various topics that we talked about today. Okay, sure. Well, NavyFederal.org. Uh, is 24-7 online. There's a ticker up top that enumerates all of our products and services, which I think is very self-explanatory. It will also show you all the different types of things that maybe we're running for the summer or any kind of promotion we have. And at the bottom, there's that 888 number, 888-842-6328. That, that's a 24-hour uh, phone line manned by Navy Federal employees uh, who can answer questions um, for you? If you, uh, yeah, I'm a lot of the things I've written. I've done different financial podcasts. I love doing these. I've enjoyed doing this with you today, Robert. Uh, and Clay Stackhouse just, 
if you Google that, you can get a whole bunch of different things. I'll tell you about saving while you're moving. I'll tell you about if you're getting out of the military, what cities to go to, what careers to go to. Uh, but, but the bottom line is I like helping uh, the people who I spent my, my life with. And that's, that's those military veterans and families. I like helping them financially. So uh, all that is out there and um, it's pretty easy. I'll be sure to put links to all those different resources below in the show notes. I'll also put links to some other credit union related uh, resources that I'm familiar with myself. Clay, thanks so much for joining me. Awesome. Great for having me. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.